In 1944, the first made-to-order handmade paper balloon bomb was launched from Japan. The target? The Western United States. The goal? Set the United States on fire, literally. Japan had been humiliated and was desperate. The Doolittle Raid in April 1942 had hit Japan right in the teeth in its capital city of Tokyo, and Japan desperately wanted revenge. So how did they land on a diabolical plan to send thousands of fire-inducing paper balloon bombs across the Pacific? It may surprise you to learn that this wasn't Japan's first foray into the wild world of explosive balloons. And it may shock you to find out that these bombs, unbeknownst to the Japanese, actually achieved one of their main objectives, but that only because of a swift and unified American decision did the real impact of these bombs remain a mystery to the world. Join us as we explore Japan's desperate plan to set the United States on fire with its Fugo, or fire bombs, and how close it came to actually working on Trailblazed. Picture this, it's the winter of 1944. You're standing out in a field in the Northwest United States and a mysterious white slow-moving object floats high in the sky over your home. Suddenly, you hear a loud whistling sound. You feel and hear a massive explosion and smoke fills the sky. You've just witnessed an unmanned Japanese aerial attack launched directly from Japanese shores just 70 hours prior, the very first of its kind to ever hit U.S. soil. Over the course of six months between November 1944 and April 1945, Japan launched over 9,000 paper bombs across the Pacific Ocean, each loaded with anti-personnel and incendiary bombs aimed at causing mass panic, hysteria, and destruction in America. The official Japanese stated intent of these bombs to burn out the vast forests of the Pacific coast and to damage the American psyche. Let's set the stage here. In the thick of World War II, Japan found itself cornered and desperate after the epic Doolittle Raid on Tokyo in April 1942. Although the raid did very little in terms of physical damage, it rattled Japan to its very core. Japan realized it could be hit on its own land in its capital city of Tokyo, and it wanted to strike back. Isolated, bombed relentlessly, the Japanese had to think outside the box. Facing dire circumstances, the Japanese conceived their unconventional and desperate plan. This wasn't the first time balloons had been used in war. In fact, in 1848, during the Italian War of Independence, an Austrian lieutenant used what is believed to be the first balloon bomb during the Siege of Venice. The Japanese idea of a balloon bomb is believed to have originated in as early as 1933, when a Japanese lieutenant general was tasked with developing new weapons of war. While the idea was eventually shelved for nearly a decade, the Doolittle Raid in 1942 brought it back to life with a fury. But the idea did have some problems. The first problem was meteorology. How do you propel unmanned balloons from Japan across the Pacific Ocean all the way to America? They would harness the power of the wind. It was the 1940s, and while fierce high-altitude winds between Japan and America had been observed in the 1920s by Japanese meteorologists, most people weren't yet aware of the powerful jet stream of the Pacific. Between 1942 to 1944, Japanese scientists and meteorologists collected data about these high-altitude wind patterns at seven meteorological stations across Japan. This data, combined with information secured from weather observations and islands across the Pacific Ocean, yielded some astounding data. First, these rivers of fast-moving air were strongest between November and March. Second, this river of fast-moving air was at an altitude of 9 to 12 kilometers, or 30 to 38,000 feet. And lastly, while the airstream varied considerably in curve as it neared the American continent, it generally flowed southward. Based on these and other observations, it was estimated that it would take the balloons approximately 30 to 100 hours to cross the Pacific. The second problem was engineering. How do you fly a balloon loaded with hundreds of pounds of munitions and equipment at a very high and cold and specific altitude for 30 to 100 hours. If launched in the daytime, the sun would dangerously heat the hydrogen gas inside the balloon, causing them to burst. Conversely, 
If launched at night, temperatures could fall to negative 50 degrees Celsius, causing the balloons to lose altitude and fall into the ocean. The solutions for these problems were actually quite ingenious. First, they had to determine what materials could be used to construct these balloons in order to withstand the elements. Japan toyed with a couple of options, paper and rubberized silk, eventually landing on the cheaper paper balloons, which would be a much easier product to mass produce the 30-foot diameter balloons. The paper, made from Japan's mulberry plant, was made from laminating multiple layers of paper together mechanically. To join the pieces of paper together, an adhesive made from a type of Japanese potato was used. And labor? Well, that was taken care of by scores of Japanese schoolgirls, who crafted each balloon intricately by hand. To keep the balloons at an optimal altitude between 30 and 38,000 feet, a gas discharge valve was added at the base of the balloon, which would discharge hydrogen gas out of the balloon if its altitude rose too high, thus lowering the balloon. And if the balloon was too low, there was an automated ballast system where bags full of sand would be triggered and dropped and thus cause the balloon to rise. The balloons would ride the jet stream across the Pacific, bouncing between 30 and 38,000 feet, when, according to Japan's calculations, the last of the remaining sandbags would be triggered and dropped, and the balloon would discharge its full payload of weapons. Stay tuned, where we'll discuss how this sand would have a huge role to play in aiding the American effort to find out who was sending these balloons to America. With the engineering and meteorological issues seemingly worked out, Japanese leadership agreed that the attack against the North American continent with balloons flown from the Japanese homeland was not impractical, so they prepared for launch. The Special Balloon Regiment, which sounds more like a circus group than a military detail, were tasked with locating and preparing launch sites. If you look at this map, you'll see that each of the launch sites were strategically hidden in rural areas on the east coast of Japan, chosen for their favorable terrain and nearby rail lines. Each launch site was equipped with hydrogen tanks, launch pads, and staging areas. The first operational launches took place on November 3, 1944, and just two days later, a U.S. Navy patrol boat spotted a balloon just off the coast of California. Soon enough, members of the public began spotting the balloons. Washington, Montana, California. From as far north as Alaska to as far south as Mexico, balloon bombs started showing up everywhere. At first, no one knew where these balloon bombs were coming from. In a stroke of luck for the Americans, one of the recovered balloons had a Japanese inspection tag inside. Other efforts were made to examine the sand inside the ballasts on the balloons when samples of the sand in the ballasts were sent to the U.S. Geological Survey, who was able to determine exactly where the sand came from. Japan. American media reported many of the earliest discoveries of the balloon bombs, however, in January 1945, the U.S. Office of Censorship asked for a publicity blackout from all news organizations, worrying that publicizing the balloon bombs could reveal to the Japanese that their attacks were actually reaching U.S. soil, potentially influencing Japanese strategy. News organizations listened, and very little was reported about the balloon bombs between January and May of 1945. The tactic actually worked, as Japanese officials later said that they finally decided the weapon as worthless and the whole experiment useless. Somewhat ironically, the first balloon bomb tragedy struck American soil only after Japan officially ended its formal bombing campaign. On May 5, 1945, in Bly, Oregon, Reverend Archie Mitchell and his group discovered a balloon bomb. It exploded, claiming the lives of Elsie Mitchell and five children, the only wartime fatalities on U.S. soil from enemy action. Shortly following this tragic incident, the War Department finally issued a statement to the public warning of the dangers associated with the balloon bombs. The paper balloon bombs, while imaginative, proved largely ineffective in the grand scheme. Of the 9,000 balloons launched, only a fraction reached North America. The majority fell into remote areas or the ocean. The remnants of these paper balloons became unexpected artifacts scattered across the North American landscape. Today, you can find historical markers in places like Oregon and Wyoming marking the spots 
where these unconventional weapons landed. Monuments like these honor the lives lost and serve as a reminder of the unexpected wartime events that touched American soil. The paper balloon bombs, though ultimately ineffective as weapons, left an indelible mark on the communities they touched. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and consider watching one of these two videos next. We'll see you in the next one.